Jacques is going to be taking us through his topic of electrical subsystems and power subsystems. And what he's done is he's actually scheduled a number of uh, question breaks so that we can, um, we can actually invite questions through, through his session so that we don't have to wait till the end. Um, when we close out the session, what I would like, please, is if you've got any additional topics to suggest those, we did have some suggestions on, on Tuesday. So um, we can simply add it to the list and we can start scheduling workshops for next week. So without further ado, um, Bianca, can I please hand over to you? Um, and before you start your presentation, please can you just um, give context of yourself in terms of your experience and your background um, so that everybody uh, really understands the approach that you're taking to everything. Thank you. Uh, I will do so. Thank you, Judy. So, yes, my, my background is that I'm a software engineer. So I don't um, really have a background in hardware at all. Um, and, and that's the reason why X in a Box um, was produced, because I wanted some technology where I could I put hardware together without uh, needing to understand hardware. So, so while I designed all the X chips and, and figured out how I want them built and, and, and how it's connected and things like that, I have a team of electronic, electronic engineers uh, behind me that actually are putting together these, um, these individual boards and design them so they're according to standards, so they have like, you know, um, uh, the right power level and protection and so on. So, so my my philosophy with this thing here was that I wanted I wanted a kind of like a, a top down learning model. So, um, I, if I ask you to think about how if you have to make a movie, and you can consider that you want to have a computer hacker in your movie, imagine in your mind how old this computer hacker would be. So you kind of like imagine James Bond or some of these kind of movies and there's like a, this computer hacker there, this geek here. And you probably come to kind of like a result that's 19 years old. Now in the same movie, you want to put in a math professor. And the, this guy, he's 65 years old. And then stop and think about that a computer hacker who is maybe 19 years old, who can break into some three letter security organization in the US, is uh, if had learned all this without actually being trained in school because you don't go and learn computer hacking in school. You maybe have ethical hacking and all that, but you don't learn to a real computer hacking. So you learn that and you learned it in such, at, at such a speed that you could figure this out when you were 19 years old in a technology that fundamentally changes uh, uh, every five years dramatically. Now compare that to your math professor who start learning math in grade one, maybe even earlier, in a, in a technology that haven't changed in 4,000 years. And you only kind of like imagine that he's clever enough about math when he's 65 in this setup you have in your head. So, so why is it like that? Well, my thinking behind that is that the way we learn, the reason why a computer hacker learns so fast is because he starts with a fully fledged uh, computer and he plays a computer game against somebody else. And uh, the guy he plays against wins all the time. And he says, what are you doing? It can't be that much better. And he tells him, well, actually, you know, I open my computer and I put another graphic card in that's fast. Okay, wow, I do the same. And now they play, the other guy still wins. And he says, well, I actually put faster memory in. And eventually he figures out, if I have to beat my friend here, I actually have to come up with this much. He maybe figure out that, hey, I can change a few parameters. And now he learns himself. But he learned by taking apart some things that work perfectly well. If you imagine a, a, a mechanic that's 19 years old, who maybe learned to drive go-karts when he was eight years old, and learned to, you know, around the corner, he had to put the hand in front of the air intake and things like that to kind of like change the, the, uh, the mix in the engine. When he's 19, he can go up to an engine and hit it with the head of a screwdriver and listen to it and say, mm, it's a carburetor. 
it's the same kind of like thinking. You start with something that's working top down, that, that is assembled, and then you learn it by taking it apart and figure out how it works. The way we learned electronics so far is that the one week we learned about resistor, the next week capacitor, then we learn about transistor, then we learn a little bit, and then we build our first something circuit in like a year's time. Why can't we do it the other way around? Why can't we get fully fledged electronics that works perfectly, and we take it apart, and we learn about resistor last? Why do we have to learn it bottom-up style? There's a lot of these different things we learn that we learn in the reverse order, simply because we get more motivated by learning top-down instead of bottom-up. So when I'm kind of like thinking about uh, X chips here, is that I build a circuit here that works. When we have classes here, they put this thing here together, and in like half an hour, they build a circuit that connects to the internet and it works all the way through. Now, they don't know anything about resistors or anything like that, but they still build something. A little like you maybe feel that you're a carpenter because you put IKEA furniture together. In reality, you're not, you're just following a, a, a recipe. Like if you cook, you're not a cook just because you followed a recipe uh, to the letter and can bake a bread. But it's the same thing that we learn by following some recipes and then we start being a little bit experimental as we go down the line. That's the philosophy by, for me by this thing here. And actually, when we started this thing here, Judy and I, many years ago, it was because we wanted to um, make sure that high school students especially was going to be interested in STEM, science, technology, and doing math, and do that into university. And therefore, we decided to have it around space because that was the most exciting. And my goal back in 2016, when I, like 15, when I started this thing here, was that I want high school students to build a satellite that can go into space. That we achieved last year, we had 41 satellites going to space built by high school students. So that is the goal, and this is where I'm coming from. So in 2016, well, 15, when I went to my first space conferences, I could not spell satellites. There was a number of T's and L's, and you know, it was like um, a test. And I knew nothing about satellites. So I'm unlike a lot of uh, other people that maybe participate in these programs here and, and guest speakers that, that Judy invites in, doesn't really have this background. So all these different things I learned from the same principle. Mm, top down, how does this work? If you saw my two uh, things on LinkBot, it was because, hey, I have to calculate how fast it works. So I read a little bit and I got some online calculator. I didn't need to learn the formulas. I can learn them later on, especially if I have to teach in the subject or something like that. But for now, I just need to get the results. And this is also what I'm gonna talk about today is that, you know, what is the kind of like stuff where we can learn about how things work and then make it into a satellite get this kind of like result faster, and then we get excited about it and we want to learn more about it. What that had resulted in is a lot of universities that takes on board um, electronic engineers in the first year. A lot of these engineers have been tinkering at their home and they go to university and everything is theory for the first year. They don't actually put anything together. So a lot of universities have come to us and say, can we not use x chips in the first year at university because at least I can build something while we're getting them through the theory so they can build the real difficult stuff later on in the year. So it's this kind of like top down mentality that is my background. Now, let me go and start uh, my presentation. And the thing is that I'm very happy if any, um, any of you kind of like want to correct me or if you think I'm wrong, or ask questions and all that kind of stuff. I'm not uh, arguing that I'm, uh, um, that I'm expert in this field. I just know a lot of small things that should be suitable for me to actually play in the, in the space of, of CubeSat. So um, let me share my presentation here. Um, share screen. So Exeter Box Power. So uh, as, as Judy had forewarned you about, we were gonna talk about what in the CubeSat industry or in the satellite industry, they call it EPS or electrical power subsystems. So this is what this is about. So the background for, 
for power on X in a box because each of the different elements in X in a box was also based on different things I saw in the industry and not necessarily the satellite industry, just in general electronics and, and building these things here. So let me just give a little bit of background here. So the first thing is, is that there's a lot of different circuit power standouts. So um, one of the most common right now is 3.3 volts, which you will see, for example, at doing a zero. While, for example, Arduino Uno uses 5 volt because that used to be the one, you know, some years back. And many, many years back, 12 volt was the standard for these electronic circuits called CMOS. And 5 volt is, was called TTL. Now, 3.3 volt is a, uh, the going standard, but a new standard is coming out that's called 1.8 volts. The lower voltage you use, the more it, uh, power saving you can have a lot of your components. But it requires a little bit extra engineering for those who make the component to make them run on 1.8 volts. We settle on 3.3 volts. So anything that runs any of the other standards, we convert to 3.3 volts. More about that. There's also many, many power supply standards. So you, what I do is every time I have some electronics I don't use anymore, I normally get rid of the electronics, but I keep the power supply. So I have boxes and boxes full of power supply. And I run anything from 1.5 volt all the way up to 48 volt, which you use for power over internet or telephone systems. And there's of course 12 volt and 9 volt and 6.5 volt and 5 volt and so on. And they have all kind of different connector types. So there's no like one standard. And, and even though there's a 10 to one standard, let me show you that that standard is actually also moving all the time. <clears throat> and then of course there's too many wires. You know, every time you want to do anything with, with Arduino, then you have to start using uh, breadboard wires. And using the breadboard wires, I kind of like find that it was not neat, uh, which is kind of like a, a generic thing when you are IT guy is that you have wires everywhere. But, uh, <clears throat> but the other thing is also that you can't just disassemble and assemble it again quickly. We wanted to have something where the student can actually take the circuit up, uh, apart at the end of the class, put it back in a box. The next class that come in can use the same X chips and build a new circuit. When it's your class that starts, you go and grab the six chips as you're working with, you quickly click them together and you get back to your programming or your experiment. If you have to do that with breadboarding or soldering and things like that, it will take you a whole hour to put it together and then the class will be over. So we wanted to eliminate wires, and that's the reason why you see, for example, a circuit like this thing here has no wires at all. And it click in to a power bank, um, and then it, it runs, of course, straight out of the blue here with no wires, and it has its stability like that. So I want to give some examples on this thing here, and I want to do it from, from single board computers. So we interface to a lot of single board computers. And this one here is the Dragon board. So you can see here that I have uh, down here the uh, 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 connector here. This is one of those that you know have like a number of different standards. And this one has a particular difficult one I couldn't find. So of all my boxes full of power supplies, I didn't have the right clock. It can, however, take and you can maybe read that uh, in the white there between 6.5 and 18 volts. So it have a nice range. Not five volts that really lot runs on now, but from 6.5 up to to 18, which means like a lot of the 12 volt supplies I have and nine volt supplies I have, they work fine. Now, what is interesting about this board, by the way, is that it has a new standard connector that's called the the 96 board standard. So if you go to 96boards.org, you will see a lot of single board computers they're using this new standard. So we have this B901 um, uh, in, at a bridge to this one here. And one of the things that this also shows very clearly is that we have to actually do a lot to get this thing here to work because you can see there's a number of different uh, chips on top of this board. This board here uh, uses five volt for power supply and it signals, that means the I square S and sorry, I square C and UART and so on runs on 1.8 volts. Normally, your power and your signal will be the same level. But in this port, a port here, it's 5 volts and 1.8. So we have to actually take the 5 volts and regulate it down to 3.3 volts as power supply. 
and we have to take the signal and we have to level the signal from 1.8 up to 3.3 uh, volts. And then there is a HDMI connector here, and I'm just saying that because you will also see that the same goes for a lot of other connectors, and I'm just taking the HDMI that changes from board to board. <coughs> Sorry. This one here is a Mino board, and this one here have an oil connector. So it's, again, a very different connector, uh, and it's five volts. So it's a, at, least, at least, you know, the, the right voltage level you're used to, for example, from all the USB stuff, UPS, sorry, USB stuff, but it's uh, still not a USB connector. However, the board runs 3.3 volts, both in signal and, uh, and power, so it was fairly easy to do the bridge. But then when I want to connect the HDMI, I have to have this converter plugged in because it runs, I think it's called micro HDMI. There's also three different micro HDMI standards in connectors, similar to with a uh, USB. This one here is a Beagle Burn Black, also fairly straightforward when it comes to uh, making a, a, a bridge for it. And this one here um, also have one of these type connectors here instead of like a common like USB. Underneath here is the micro HDMI connector. And finally, this is the Raspberry Pi, which is also 3.3 volts and, um, uh, on, on both signal and on bus. And, um, and it has a power that is a standard micro USB, which is nice because a lot use that standard. Ever since the early Android phone came out, there was a lot that started using that. So there's a lot of cables and a lot of power banks and things like that, that that runs the standard. And it runs a nice, big, standard size um, HDMI. So what do we have of choices here? So first of all, as I mentioned, we use 3.3 volt standard across all our boards. If a board have a sensor that runs 1.8 volts, we regulate the power on that board to a 1.8 volt. If it runs 5 volts, we regulate it up to five volts and the same with the signals. So nobody has to consider when I click something together if it's a one power or other power. Uh, we power all our uh, devices via that Xbox and via this connector that we have sitting between. So these connectors here have all the different power. And you can see here in some of the details here is that we have ground, we have 3.3 volts. Then we also if, if you, for example, connect like a battery or a USB power supply, you can get that raw power, we call it V source. So not the raw up below, but that power that comes in, we have that uh, available also. And that's gonna be interesting when later on in my presentation you have access to that. But in order to get access to that, you have to solder that point here. And the reason for that is that you might have some boards that wanna use that power and the power level is not standardized. It can typically be five volts, but it will be in this case here because this will take the USB power, the raw USB power, and put out to this V source. And it'll be five volts. But it could be the BPO4 that's AA battery, and they have two batteries of 1.5 volts. It will take those three volts and put out to V source. So therefore, you have to activate it if you want to use the V source by simply solder, uh, put a little bit of solder that covers those two pins there. Now, normally you don't have to solder, and also this one is seldom you have to use it for anything, but if you want to use it, that's, um, then you have to activate it here. So the overview, uh, and then I'm going to uh, make open for some questions here. So the overview is that we have USB power where we have something we call PO1 and PO2. The one runs uh, USB A. Um, so that's like uh, like this one here. This is the USB uh, PU01, as you can see here, and it have a normal um, connector here. And then we have the PO2 that uses a micro USB uh, connector. So this is not the one, but you can see here that there will be like a connector like this that have the micro USB. This is a an another interface, but it has and it also provide power, but it have this kind of like micro USB. So that's the PO2. Then we have battery solution. On one side, we have PPO1 and PPO4. They're both AA batteries. And we're gonna look much more into the PPO4. The difference is the PPO1 just provides the power, while PPO4 also gives you some sensing capability 
so you can learn a little bit about how to use the power. So therefore, that's the one, the PBO4 is the one you have in your flight kit on the XK90. And then we have the PBO2, which is just a coin cell uh, power supply. And, and that looks like, like this one here. And you can see it just takes a normal coin cell on the back. And that's useful for stuff that doesn't run all the time, which I'm also getting back to later on. We have what we call a generic power supply where you can put any six to 24 volt connector uh, to this PD01. And it just takes a two pin, it doesn't matter what order, it will automatically change it to the right direction. So it's kind of like protection by reverse uh, polarization, but you can put your car battery to this thing here. You might have a old power supply like I have, you can put it in. Maybe you wanna use it for like a garage door opener, or gate opener, and you already have some power down there. It can be 18 volt, it can be 9 volt, it can be anything, and you can just plug it in there. Then we have two for LiPo batteries, the PLO1 and PLO2. Now, the one is without solar and the other is with solar. What that means is that you can connect a solar panel to it. But we don't have solar panels that work with PLO2. So the PLO2, we are basically kind of like modifying slightly. You can use it as well as the PLO1, and if you want to use the solar facility, you might have to solder a bit with the PLO2 but we're changing that one. And then we have all the bridges, like the pictures I showed before with the single board computers, they all provide power also. So if you connect your chips to a single board computer or otherwise use one of our interfaces, then you don't need power otherwise. So all those are providing power as well. So that's kind of like the, the power um, spectra in the Exxon box setup. Um, so at this point here, I'd like to take some questions and give a little bit break. Judy. Great. Bianca, thank you. Shivam does have a question for you. He's had his hand up. Shivam, can I hand over to you? Hi, uh, I had some questions on like uh, basically the using power for like, if you were to use power for like solar electric propulsion or just electric propulsion, how would we count that? Because many times we don't, if you have destinations other than uh, let's say Earth, we definitely would be using probably power for propulsion either ways. So how would we count that part? And also like if we're using like um, single board comp uh, computers, which are kind of new, like the Jetson Nano, let's say for example, or the Raspberry Pi 4, would the, would the same products be applicable over there as well? Or it's only for the previous models? Thank you. Okay, so, um, so let's take those two questions. So the first one is that, when it, when it comes to power and, and satellites, we, we, are, we are not necessarily building anything that we planned that was a complete kit to put a CubeSat into um, a, to orbit. Um, when we have, when we have had stuff in orbit before, it has been a part of a satellite. So typically the payload, the CPU and so on. So, so right now we, we don't have like a complete kit where you can build a, 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 the entire CubeSat and, and even if we had, we would probably not have anything that would be able to power any kind of propulsion system or anything like that. So, so um, if we had, if we were doing anything power-wise that will, that will end up in a cube set, it will be something that will be able to charge a light battery based on a you know, standard solar panel. And, and that will be that. I, I will come back to, and then the reason why we have the, the cube set interface is that you can go out and get yourself a, a, a power supply, um, so EPS system that have maybe all the battery structure or interface or connectivity to solar panels, things like that. And you can click that into the, the PC104 uh, CubeSat interface that we support in our kit. And then we'll be able to supply power to, to our chips as well. That, so so, so um, I, I don't have any kind of like specific solution for any advanced use of power when it comes to, uh, to flying a satellite. When it comes to, to running the, um, the, the different single board computers, so what we do have is that uh, we have, and I'm just holding up this, uh, let me just stop sharing here so I can have a little bit more screen here. So, so this is um, a little stacker I have. So this thing here is actually uh, something that could fit inside a can set. So you'll be able to put uh, 21 X tips together in like one stack like that into a, a can set. This is exactly a can set height. So like uh, minus a few millimeter. And, and, um, and this is the 66 millimeter that, that uh, is a limitation or actually 64 millimeter or something like that. There's limitation for, uh, for, um, um, 
for cancer. And you can see here, I have the, uh, the um, 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 uh, Raspberry Pi Zero here. Now the Raspberry Pi Zero, if I pull that out here, so, so you can provide a, a Raspberry Pi Zero power with one of the micro USB ports here. But if I connect my, my AA battery to this thing here, uh, we're using my standard connector here, it will reverse also power the, the Raspberry Pi. So some of our power supplies, uh, not necessarily all like for example, point cell and things like that, we can't do magic here with, if we don't have enough power. But like um, a double A battery will be able to power this uh, 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 Raspberry Pi Zero. And of course, if you have a LiPo battery and, and use the PLO one or something like that, and then you know, um, uh, charge that, you can, you can run your single board computer like that um, with, with that. Um, so, um, so these boards here, for example, this one here, which, which I uh, took a picture of earlier, you cannot provide power here and it will power, power the whole circuit. You might be lucky to do that with some of them, but you know, many of them, they actually want the power from, from the main power connector, not necessary here. So the power goes in here and it comes out here, not necessary the other way. You might be able to get away with, with some of them, but for example, uh, the standard for a Raspberry Pi uh, 3 is that they want <coughs> Sorry, they want three amp power going in, and we are only providing um, um, very little. Uh, in this case here, we providing the power straight through because we don't have to regulate it. But if you have to regulate it, we provide like between half and one amp of power. This one here, if the if you could power the Raspberry Pi using five volt directly uh, on these pins, then you can also power it through our connector because this is just like. A connector. There's no like focus, focus on this thing here. Just convert from these pins to these pins down there. So um, uh, we have we've done uh, these uh, bridges here for 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 the Raspberry Pi, and that bridge also works with the Pi Four. And not that I've tried it, but I know that uh, the pins haven't changed at all. And of course, the Pi Four doesn't use the micro USB anymore. It uses USB C. So it uses another power supply, the, the, the newer power supply that a lot of uh, Android phones and, and uh, maybe um, iPhones do in the future, but certainly uh, iPads and, uh, and the new Mac uh, books uh, is using also. Judy? Great. Uh, Warren has a question for you, Bjarke, about yeah. uh, LiPo batteries, et cetera. Warren, if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, yes, uh, I guess the question is, do you have a charge controller such that you can have solar panels charge a LiPo battery? Is that part of your power boards or power chips? Yeah, so, so the, the PLO2 is, is one that is like that. Uh, so I don't have a PLO2 here on my desk. Uh, I have a lot of all chips, but we have 80, so it's not that I have all of them. So the PLO2 is actually one that's a chip, uh, you know, standard size like these chips here. And it it has like a connector for a LiPo battery. So you can connect like a standard LiPo battery uh, to it. Uh, it have a connector and if you don't like the connector, you can of course change it. And it has like a micro USB, so you can charge it using micro USB. It have a charging circuit. It have an LED telling you whether you're charging or not charging. It also have a LED telling if it's on or off, there's a little switch on it. The solar panel, is coming in via one of these pins here. And what we're doing right now is we're changing it from coming in via these pins to actually have a screw terminal on the board so you can connect like a solar panel like this thing here. And the reason why we had it like that was because we originally wanted to put the solar panels, like these solar panels here, on a, on a, on a, a chip like that, and then you could just click it in. But that's not, uh, that wasn't sustainable for us, so therefore, Instead, we're gonna change the PLO2, but if you want to do something right now, you can actually get one of the PLO2s and you just have to solder a switch on to some of these pins here instead. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Judy, can I move on? Uh, I'm just gonna say yes. that, I mean, a lot of the thing about power and things like that is also coming on in, in some of the, uh, you know, I'm of course coming further in, and into details with the PPO4 and how some of these things here works and all that kind of stuff. So 
not the question here. I might actually answer as I move on. I'm of course still happy to get them if it's directly related to something I said. But if they're a little loose uh, and I haven't covered it, you know, I might cover it as I go ahead. Okay, yeah, great. If you wouldn't mind continuing, I, I need you to bear in mind that we've only got 29 minutes left. That's cool. So now I'm going into the CubeSat EPS here, so electrical power systems. And one of the things you have to understand, if you put a satellite into space, unless you put it into space in like sand orbit of like 200 kilometers, something like that, where it will only be in space for let's say five days. If you go to like 300 uh, kilometers, which is like the lowest uh, kind of like uh, uh, orbit that's, that's useful for any uh, serious stuff, then it'll be up there for anything between three to eight weeks. And if you go to 400 kilometers, you can probably get like half a year. And if you go to 600 kilometers, you can get like 25 years. So in all cases, you will not have a battery that lasts long enough if it's gonna do anything useful. So there is uh, solutions out there that can run on a con cell battery for many, many years, but that's typically like something that you read the water level once a month. So it wakes up once a month, read the water level, send it over maybe a very low power rate to like a lower and fall asleep again, you know, five seconds later and then sleep for a month. And of course, with a solution like that, you can run for a very long term on a battery that's not rechargeable. But if you use anything, uh, Serious, then you need solar panels. And that's the only viable power that is available for anybody that probably worked in the CubeSat today. I'm not saying there's only power solution out there. There is satellite that runs on, um, uh, on nuclear power and things like that, but that's probably not in, within the, the reach of any of us or anybody who listens to this channel here. So, so the thing is that uh, solar panel is the only way. When you recharge a battery, you call it a secondary battery. If you have a battery that's fully charged, that means a fully, a, 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 you know, non-rechargeable battery that's full, it's called a bi primary battery. And when you send up a CubeSat, your the rechargeable battery have to be flat. Uh, they have, have to be fully discharged. And if you have a primary battery, you can have that fully charged. So many satellites are using both, where they use a fully charged battery to, for example, open the solar panel, or open antenna and things like that. And they can then start charging and then I can charge the secondary batteries, the, the rechargeable batteries. So let me just quickly go through a little bit of math just because we need to understand a little bit when we start calculating a power budget here. So the first thing is that when you are in a low earth orbit, um, then you have to fly around uh, 7.8 kilometer per second. Okay, so uh, the thing is that when you fly at that speed, you are flying fast enough that you're dropping towards Earth all the time, but you're missing Earth. And you keep on doing that, and that's what keeps you in orbit. If you fly slower, you will fall into Earth. And if you fly faster, you will leave Earth. So, but there's nothing up there that kind of like slows you down. So there's no like track or anything like that. In principle, of course there is, but for the principle of this thing here, a rocket that can get you to 28,000 kilometer, allows you to kind of like just fly in that orbit almost forever. Uh, there is drag because there's still atmosphere, even though it's very, very, very thin, and it drags against your, your, your satellites, so you're slowly um, getting further and further down. And the, the closer you get to Earth, the more atmosphere there is, and the more it drags. So suddenly you're kind of like getting so far down that uh, yeah, you actually end up burning up in the atmosphere. But the 28,000 kilometer is what we have to hang on to here. The LEO circumference is 40,000 kilometers, just roughly. Of course, it depends on how far you are in your LEO, you, because that's from anywhere from 200 kilometer maybe to 1,200 kilometer. But I'm putting 4,200 here because that helps on the map. Uh, an orbit is uh, a 42,000 kilometer con in circumference. And you can fly that with 28,000 kilometer per hour gives you one and a half hour or 90 minutes to fly around Earth. And that's, for example, what the International Space Station flies around Earth every 90 minutes. So if you divide that into a day, that means that in a day you have 16 orbits. Now, a satellite is stationary. And what I mean by that is that, of course, it flies around the Earth, but it flies in the same path around the Earth. 
The difference is that the Earth rotates. So every time it comes around, the Earth has rotated a little bit, you know, similar to a 90 minute out of a full day. So it doesn't come over your ground station again. Then it rotates and uh, flies over again, and you rotate another similar to one and a half um, hour. Now, when you've done that eight times, you actually come to the other side. And because it actually come around Earth, then you will see your satellite again. But every second time you will see it coming over in one direction, the next time coming over in another direction. So you get two flyover in a day of your satellite on your ground station. So <coughs> two views per 24 hours of each eight orbits. So, so this is one of the things that if you are considering building a satellite, this is a mess that you have to have behind you. And, and there is a lot of more details into this thing here. So let me just show you some on the web here. So the one is that I found this orbit power calculation. So there's a whole article here that talks about, you know, going in and doing your, uh, your power calculation here. And I'll kind of like show a little bit about the graphs when it comes up and down in, in charting, discharging and so on. So, so there's a lot of math behind it here. But I want to kind of like uh, just jump to this um, picture here of the International Space Station here. And uh, Judy, can you see this thing here? Because um, it's like full screen here. So I just want to make sure that yes. you still can yes, see. Yes, you can. Okay. So, so you can see right now the satellite is flying over uh, Korea or something like that, about to pass over uh, Japan. And you can see in one and a half hour, it will then fly you know, um, next to this thing here. So, so it's kind of like it started here and it came up in the yellow and then it followed the white one and next time it come over here. <clears throat> so while the Earth is rotating, and this is the reason why it looks like this curve, it actually just by around in circle, but when Earth rotating and you look down, this is the different path you see. So, and you can see here the 28,000 kilometer power is in this case 27,587. So, um, uh, who's counting, and the altitude is now 422, and it goes up and down a little bit. So this is kind of like, and, and this is a LEO orbit, this is an orbit that many could actually end up having the satellite flying in, because if you, for example, launch a satellite with NanoRacks, they send it up to the International Space Station, and then it's being launched out of the JAXA uh, launch facility they have up there for, for, for CubeSat satellites, and then we'll fly in exactly the same inclination. That means it'll fly in the same route. And this is not a bad one because it doesn't fly over the poles. It's not a polar orbit. And that means you have le less radiation because the Van Allen belt protects you um, over, um, over the normal part of um, our planet, not over the poles, but, but the rest. So, so for a satellite that flies over and higher up there, this is an excellent um, inclination to fly on. Let's go back here um, and then um, look at this picture here. So when we talk about how to look at solar power and, and, and do a solar, uh, do a, a power budget for, for your satellite in space, then this is kind of like a graph I drew to kind of like illustrate this thing here. So the way you have to look at this thing here is that one segment like that, one wave like that, that is one orbit. So this is, this is a graph that shows how it charges. So this is, let's call it the, the charge level of a battery on the y-axis and time out of the, the x-axis. So this, this part here is one orbit. And the part that goes uphill in, in, in that wave here, that is when, uh, when your uh, solar panel is in the sun. That means in, in the 45 minutes, it's flying on the sun side of Earth. And of course, the whole idea is that at that time you are spending some power because you're always spending some power when you have a satellite in space, but hopefully you're charging more than you're spending. So when you are on the dark side where you spend power without charging anything, you're spending less. And of course that builds up, you know, over eight orbits, that builds up the power all the way up. And when you get to your ground station, when it flies over the ground station and send a signal to say, please download all the material you have to me, the radio contact, that's typical where you use a lot of power. Now, just take this as a, as a, uh, a kind of like a, a diagram for how to think about this thing here, because this could be nearly 
just uh, you know a, a straight line if you have a constant uh, use of power and a constant solar panel that come in the power and you use for example global star or some um, uh, a radio uh, um, solution where you can actually download or upload data constantly you don't have to wait till you're over a ground state but this is kind of like more the traditional one where you have your amateur radio on board and you wait to the uh, should comes over your ground station and you have your 10 maximum 14 minutes from horizon to horizon of your satellite that you can then download your data from so at that point i kind of like covered a little bit about the the, um, the cubesat thinking about power budget i'm going to now talk about um, um, uh, our battery solution that is in the kits that we provide to kind of like uh, get a little bit down on the ground again but if there's any question i can have a little pause here judy uh, yes there is uh shivam has uh, his hand up for a question hi uh, yeah i had a question i mean like for gps or for i mean for a prototype i would say we're going to be using gps but probably we're going to be using higher radio frequencies if we're building a real model which hopefully that would happen uh, probably later on but since this competition or in general we normally first start off with the prototype so I wanted to ask, like, if I would have, like, a, I can't really read this right now. I probably have to on my video on if that's okay with you, because I have a, the model in front of me. I'm not entirely sure on how, how much power that would need. So how do we normally calculate that? Okay. So so the, the power budget is, is uh, so first of all, when, when you cal calculate the power, it's, uh, it's, it's obviously, and, and there's a lot of material on this thing here, so I'm not going to, go way into the detail here but but the, the way to look at this thing here is that uh, on our battery module we can we can get the the voltage level and we can get the the, the current draw that it it draws and then of course you multiply those two numbers together and you get your uh, the watches that you're using and and uh, and you will then have an idea about how much power you use in your circuit now what you want to do is that you want to measure that continuously so when you have your model on your desk, you will have a, a scope or you, know, you can use our uh, uh, module here to, to see how much power that your circuit is using all the time. So what you do is that you kind of like uh, accumulate all the, the, the current that uses sometimes higher, sometimes low, and you put them together and you maybe graph them. You maybe even kind of like say, well, I'm now no doing this, so I know this is taking so much a current and now I'm doing this that will do much less and I'll take this kind of current and now I'm sending some data and then use super lot of current and then you kind of like time it and you actually multiply all this let's call it the area uh, area underneath your graph and say this is my power button then when you take a solar panel you do the same thing you actually figure out normally on the solar panel it will tell you how much power it comes in but the easiest to actually connect this um, solar panel and then start charging you know batteries and figure out how fast does it charge it? There's calculations online where it can tell you how much uh, sun you get on your solar panel, depending on how you structure it. So if you put on a CubeSat, where you put solar panel, let's say on six sides, then you're of course not gonna have sun on all of them, but you're gonna have a kind of like more or less a constant value because it's maybe like a third on three panels or one panel get all the sun. And then you have like an idea about how much sun you're getting even if you're not directing your satellite or, you know, attitude control your satellite to point at the sun. If you have attitude control, you also have to make sure you can point your solar panels so they point at the sun in order to maximize that. As you calculate this thing here, you'll figure out how much power you're going to use because the, the battery you have is just for storage. It doesn't, of course, generate any power. So you have to have a, a, a first of all, you have to say, this is all the power I'm using. And then you have to have solar panel where you know that this can generate all the power. Now, if the power level that you are using is kind of like, a lead, like kind of like constant over time, then you don't need an, a lot of battery power. But if you're using burst of power, then you need the battery to support that. So that's the kind of like calculations. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into a little bit more in depth about some of that in how you can use that on the PBO4. So let me do that and then maybe I can come back to, to some of the questions uh, later on here. 
So on the PPO4, and, and so I'm going to use this uh, as a little bit of examples also. So the PPO4, this is this uh, black uh, AA battery holder that sits there on, on, on the bottom. Uh, I'm holding there in the, in the picture. And it takes two standard AA batteries. And I have a couple of AA batteries here that I've been using. So um, they're energizer lithium batteries. And the only reason why I'm using that is because they go to minus 40 degrees Celsius, which coincidentally also minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we have launched these kits on, on party balloons. So we have like, you know, a, a 36 inch party balloon, so like quite a big party balloon. And uh, we fill it with helium and then we let it go. And, um, and of course, um, uh, depending on, you know, uh, what kind of quality a party balloon it is and how, how much helium we put in, uh, compared to you know the, the weight of a satellite, which is more or less constant. So if we don't put too much helium in, it will raise slower, but it will go far, further up. If we you know put too much helium in, it will go faster up, but it will also pop quicker. And all that there's calculations for, for for those kind of stuff. But we just use a party balloon. The most expensive there is actually the helium. But um, uh, because we have a non-profit organization, we get that donated. And the party balloon is, is, is fairly cheap in, in comparison. So what we do is we fly this in here, and, and what the, I think last time we flew it, it actually went uh, to uh, 12,000 uh, meters, so that's like 36,000 feet, so you know higher up than than Alan flies. And uh, that is minus 52 degrees Celsius. That is minus 62 Fahrenheit in comparison. But the battery, of course, that guaranteed to minus 40 doesn't mean they can't take the last uh, part off there. And they work fine. We've got radio signal and GPS information, all that all the time. Now these batteries are 3000 milliamp hours. So this is two, bar, two times 1.5 volts, and that is three volts at 3000 milliamp hours. Of course, that regulates to 3.3 volts, which means that begins on less milliamp hours, like something like 2700 milliamp hours. But that's um, the battery we're using here. And one of the reasons I also mention here is that when you read a data sheet, for example, on a pair of batteries that you know, has a proper brand name, you can see here, you can offload two and a half amp continuously from this thing here. And of course, if you do that, it will not last much more than over an hour. Um, and if you can also do pulses with four amp. Um, and, and that's great because, uh, because of this little pin we have where we can take the V source of this battery, we can take that out to one of our other modules, which we call an OC01. And that's actually a, a module that can take the raw battery power and send it out on, on one of the pins. So you can see here, I have the OC01 here on my screen here. So what that does is that you can actually put a burn wire between the two, a nichrome wire, like you have in a toaster. And then you can activate that with the power from the, from the battery directly. And that will heat off the wire to such a degree that if it's a thin wire, it will burn over. But otherwise, you can have a nylon wire connected to it, and it will burn through the nylon wire in like, you know, five, 10 seconds. And that's, uh, that's okay. It's not gonna uh, discharge the battery so much. You just turn it off for that little period of time, and then on it, off again. And then you can use that. In this case, we have, uh, I think, up to three uh, connections here. So you can use one to let go of the balloon. So say you, for example, don't want to fly higher than 10 kilometers. You might have a parachute that you can open or pop open in your, uh, your solution here. And that's also controlled by a, a burn wire or like some spring loader mechanism with nylon wire. Then you can pop that open. And you can even have a launch control system where you have an island wire that holds uh, the satellite down and then can send a message to the satellite about burn over the anchor wire, things like that. And there's uh, different things you can do to kind of like uh, have a feeling of control over your uh, your satellite here when you fly. So there's other options because I mean, the battery is great when you when you fly, but when you are using it in, 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 in a lab or in a classroom or at home, and play with this thing, you don't want to just burn through batteries. So you can use rechargeable batteries, obviously. Now the, the PBO4 can't recharge the battery. You have to take them out, put them into a recharge and then put them back again. So it's a normal, um, can just use battery as, as any kind of other thing that takes normal AA batteries. 
Um, you can also take the IP01, so, so you will get an IP01 like that, but of course, you know, you're know you probably using that for your ground station. So you might either get another one or get another power supply if you if you don't want to you know, uh, click battery in and out all the time. Um, so you can use any of the many others I've suggested before for, for, for that uh, for, for a project like that. And of course, you can also use the IP01 as I demonstrated before where <coughs> you simply take a, a power bank like this thing here and um, and you click it in. And then of course it's mobile and in this case here, we have 4,000 million in power on these power banks. So, so and they, they're of course rechargeable and they're pretty cheap because they're like standard USB uh, power banks that have been sold almost everywhere. Uh, on the PBO4, if you want to code this thing here, we have a library. So there's a link to it here. We also have a library for, for other coding solutions. And I'm coming back to that in lessons later on where we're going to talk more about programming. <coughs> But for now, I just want to refer to the Arduino library here. And we have two um, uh, uh, two functions, one that says get voltage and one that says get current. And and I've taken this little screenshot here for this uh, lithium battery that actually shows what is the voltage level depending on how much it has been discharged. So you can use that get voltage to see approximately where is it on this scale here. And you can use the get current to figure out how much are you actually burning at any given point. So you can you know, have like an a, a, a interrupt routine where you do your get current all the time and then you can kind of like accumulate in your, in your project how much power are you going through. So you can see this is actually the power. So you might want to use the get voltage to see where you are, but you can also just, uh, thank you very much. You can also just use the get current to actually I'm going to calculate what is my power budget, how, how much power I'm spending all the time. So instead of trying to measure all the different things, then what I would do is I will have this get current, I will have an interrupt routine that actually runs in my code, and maybe you know every uh, second or whatever, I go in and say, what is the power level, and I use that. Or if I know I'm doing certain things, that's why I want to figure out what the power is, I could call my get current, and I can then in my routine kind of like calculate all that. Now, when it comes to the voltage level, it measures it on the batteries, not on the output from the conversion of the battery. So it measures on the three volts which a battery comes in, not the 3.3 volt, because the 3.3 volt will be 3.3 volt, whether the battery actually deliver three volts or 2.7 or whatever it is, because it will keep on pumping it up to 3.3 volt, even when the battery drops to nearly uh, in this case, you can see they can drop down to 1.4 volts each before they, they give up. But when it comes to the current consumption, then it actually measures the current that you draw from the 3.3 volt power supply that comes out of the PPO4. So that way you have, this is the two major things, voltage times current gives you wattage, that's the energy consumption used. So you have the information need in order to uh, do that. There are, of course, more elegant solution than this one here. There's something called a column counter that actually measures this thing here without that you actually have to, um, you know, connect all the time. But for the learning process, uh, then this is actually the better way of doing that. So one actually understands how this uh, um, battery um, budget is being spent. So I have uh, very little time left. So if I can just take two slides more and then I'm actually gone and then I can, you know, close with question at that point. Judy, is that all right? Yes. So this is just a couple of tips and tricks for, um, for, for you know, consideration when it comes to power, especially. But there's a couple of other side um, uh, um, ideas with these tips and tricks that, that, that I like. So the tip number one here is sleep. So what I made by sleep is that um, if you're, a CPU is not doing anything, put it to sleep. Because uh, uh, if it just runs around, even though it's not doing anything, then there's a lot of stuff that happen in the background and that all spends power. So if you know you're not going to do anything, then put it to sleep. And you can do the same in the sense that there's command, you can send to sense and say sleep and you know don't do anything, or you can disconnect to them. And there's a lot of different things you can do in order to lower your power consumption. 
So on the CS11, which is the core that sits on the flight, uh, flight module, there's a library here that's called RTC zero. So RTC stands for real-time clock. So on many of the cores, there's a real-time clock built into it. You can also get loose real-time clock. But in this case here, you want to control the power on the CS11. So what you do is you say to the CS11, I'm running a real-time clock. And that always runs even though that the CPU, the main part of the CPU is not running. And <clears throat> what you actually do is you say to it, go to sleep. And then you say to the real-time clock, at a certain time, please wake up again. And it will then wake up the main CPU of the, the CS11. And the same goes for the CW1. Now, I haven't put a link in here because there's so much written about this thing here. So rather just uh, Google ESP.DeepSleep and you'll find a lot of, lot of, lot of literature on how to put the CW1 uh, into sleep and wake it up again. And it can wake up after some time. It can wake up because there's an interrupt on a pin. It can wake up from, from a number of different events. Now, I'm not gonna go into how deep sleep works and see how that is not like the safe in here. But because it's a Wi-Fi chip, and Wi-Fi is really, really expensive when it comes to power, it will maximum burn 170 milliamp at a time. But in typical, when it's just running, then it will use 70 milliamp. Now, the two AA batteries I had before with the 3000 uh, milliamp hours, which is kind of like really juicy, they will, less, they will last less than two days if you just run this, uh, this CW1 with a, with a AA battery. So that's a very costly affair to run it like that, and of course, um, we don't. We haven't provided a battery for the CW1. The CW1 will typically sit like in a circuit where you will have an IP01 and it will be connected to your laptop or something that's rechargeable, like a power bank or something like that. Now, if you put it to sleep, it will only use 20 microamps, and then it will last longer than 15 years on the AA battery. That's a difference. It will go from less than two days to more than 15 years. Now, obviously. If you're in deep sleep, it's not doing anything for those 15 years. But if you imagine that it just wakes up, do something for like three, five seconds, and then go to sleep for an hour or whatever, then you can imagine what three to five seconds is out of a, uh, you know, uh, 3,600 seconds days in an hour. So, so it's that kind of like um, math that will save you a lot of power when you, when you put your power budget together here. Now, then I think that is with deep sleep is the way deep sleep actually works is that it shuts down the CPU. So when it wakes up, up again, it doesn't wake up somewhere in your code where you put it to sleep. No, no, no. When you put it to sleep, it actually shuts down similar to that you reset it or reboot it. So when it starts, again, it starts from the top. Now you can store stuff in like memory that doesn't uh, go away. So, so you can, when it wakes up again, you can say, where was I last time? And you can direct it and things like that. But typically, when you wake up again, the, car, the code starts over. And because of that, if your code has like a memory leak, and if you haven't programmed for, for a long time, you might not know what that means. But you will typically put a program together, and then it will run perfectly for, for days, maybe weeks, and suddenly it will not run. And that's because there's maybe a little memory leak that's slowly kind of like leaking into the code and eventually affects your code. And they're the worst kind of code uh, problems because you can't find them. But if you go to sleep and start, you will never see that because it will be like the code actually restarts every five seconds. So it will be, if it worked for five seconds, it will also work for five seconds again. And that brings me to my last slide with this uh, trick here, and you can use a watchdog timer. There's a, a couple of links here for watchdog timer for CS11, CW2. But a watchdog timer is like, like, you know, when you go to the mafia and say, listen, I have pictures here, and uh, I send them to my lawyer, and he will send them to uh, the magazine or to the, the, to the uh, newspaper if I'm not um, calling him and say, don't do that. Um, so it's not like I have to send the pictures to the magazine. No, I already arranged it, so if I don't stop it, then they're being sent. And that's what a WhatsApp timer is, is that I'm starting a WhatsApp timer, and if I'm not getting back into control and being able to say to a WhatsApp timer, no, no, it's fine, everything is cool. Then the watchdog time will say, okay, I'm resetting the circuit here. I will actually uh, stop the CPU and start over and start the program over again. And that's great because it can also be used if, for example, your power level is kind of like fluctuating. 
So let's say, for example, the power level dips. It might be that you have a something in your circuit that suddenly uses a lot of power, and therefore, when it kind of like dips something, it's like suddenly dip the power in the entire circuit. And you can then tell, and sometimes the CPU can't take that because it might, you know, do something that it wasn't meant to do because some bits and bytes are moved around in the in the program. So the watchdog timer can say, hey, the power went less than three volts or something like that, and I can't tolerate that. So please restart the whole thing so I know that the status is safe. So what's the timer? Deep sleep is some of the tricks to make sure that your power uh, budget and the way you run your circuit always works, especially in space. You have no chance to fix it once it's space. You can fix everything that's in a server room, but once you send it up there in orbit, that's it. Uh, if it doesn't work up there, you can't get it, you can't pull over to the side, you can't do anything. So therefore you have to make sure you have all the different things in order that make sure that it works up there. And power is one of those things that if it doesn't work, then um, you have, uh, there's no backup. So with that, Judy, that's it for me. I know I'm a couple of minutes over, but I'm happy to take some quick questions. Otherwise, as usual, you can always email and ask uh, more questions down the line. And of course, we're here twice a week, so you can also accumulate the question to next time if uh, you prefer to do so. Uh, great. Bjarke, we have one, we have one question from Warren. Unfortunately, he had to, he had to be somebody, somewhere else two minutes ago, but um, he's, he said he, he's looking forward to the video. So let's put it on the video for him. Um, are supercapacitors useful for peak power demands? Yeah, so, so, so um, supercapacitors is, is definitely useful for, for that. And we, we actually, um, we, we, we have like some circuits that we prototyping that have using supercapacitors. We have like some very, very, very small solar cell uh, chips that we are working on that, that, can, that can feed, for example, ultra low power solutions. And we use supercapacitors there. So they're not, they're, they're, you know, there's all these stories here about how Tesla is using supercapacitors to give it like some oomph when they, when they suddenly need to, uh, you need to put the pedal down. And also, if you break a lot and therefore have to absorb a lot of energy coming back from the wheels, then you also want supercapacitors because as good they are to discharge fast, they're also good to absorb a lot of power uh, fast. So you can charge them very fast. They're very, they're very inefficient when it comes to density because they're like, um, uh, the, the biggest problem is they're just big and bulky compared to how much power they can hold. So they, they're only very good for like very specific um, uh, other solutions where you hardly need any power, but you really want to just have the, the, the peak. And, and in our case, we will have used batteries, but supercapacitor is uh, easier to, um, to use because of, um, of shipping regulations, because we can't ship stuff that uses rechargeable batteries because of DHL and FedEx. So when we do some of our X chips, we will use supercapacitors instead because that doesn't fall underneath uh, those kind of regulations. So for completely different reasons, non-technical reasons, we will sometimes use uh, supercapacitors. For, for any application here, with this thing here, I can't see any kind of like specific uh, reason to use it. It have not come across uh, my mind to use supercapacitors. But if one have like something very, um, you know, specific, powerful recharging, re like a railgun <laughs> or whatever it can be, then uh, supercapacitors is certainly maybe the only option. Yes. Right, and then we have uh, one another question from Shiva. Hi, sure. Okay. Um. So my question was, uh, basically about, um deep space areas of, um, so, I mean, apart from instruments, if they are, let's say instruments, we don't really need to be really uh, active to control, like, let's say if using an imager, we would need, but if you're not actually using that yet, we are traveling to deep space destinations, how, like, what a rough estimate we would need to probably make the CPU sleep, because you're mentioning on saving power, that's really good solution, because the farther you go from the, from Earth or from Sun, 
that's important. So, like, if we were to travel into Venus and beyond, because that's kind of what we're trying to look at, how long do you think we should probably charge it or probably just keep it to sleep? Yeah, so, I mean, the thing is that, um, uh, yeah, the, 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 I think that the thing here with sleep and how much you have to sleep and things like that, you should rather think about it from a from lower ankle. Think about it as a tool in your toolbox. So, you know, in, in, in the beginning when you put your circuit together and things like that, what happens is that little and if you put a race car together, you, you kind of like say, okay, what kind of performance do I get? Um, my CPU is awake all the time. And uh, if you remember Apollo, uh, I was at Apollo 13, the movie Apollo 13, and they, they have to re uh, restart the CPU and they have to keep themselves under, I don't know, one amp or 10 amp or things like that. And they tried all different kinds of things to figure out if I do it that order, that order, that order. So think a little bit about this thing here with deep sleep is to kind of like say, well, you know, I, I have so much solar panel and I have so much, and, and I calculated that I might stop using so much power. Now, I need to save an amp, let's say that, or whatever you want to measure your, your power, your, I need to save a watt or whatever it is. Then you kind of like go in and say, well, maybe, maybe if I sleep here, because I'm actually not doing anything here, or maybe if I kind of like, and, and many times, depending on, you know, the CPU is not, not, might not be the most expensive one when it comes to, to, to run anything. If you're using like, you know, uh, some advanced instrument, like for example, you use a Geiger counter, they use way more power than any CPU does. So, so many times it's a mark to take some of your instrument and say, instead of using them five seconds every one hour, you maybe use them four seconds one every hour. But if you kind of like, say, ah, I need to kind of like, I'm flying over here, I need to have it running for 10 minutes because that's a total flyover and I need it for that or like a radio or something like that. Then you might try to say, listen, you know, where can I save this thing here? So, so more think about that. Well, I could also save some power by putting my CPU to sleep. Now, my calculation I gave here looked very fantastic because I used something that used Wi-Fi and you would never use Wi-Fi in space. But there's plenty of other radios you will use that use plenty of, of, of uh, power. But in this case here, this is the core that also uses Wi-Fi. So therefore, when the core runs, you kind of like have the Wi-Fi running in the background and therefore, in this case here, I could also turn the Wi-Fi off and maybe have the CPU running normally, but just turn the Wi-Fi off and then I will save plenty of power. So, so there's a lot of different things and so the, the lengths you have to run with is not necessarily um, uh, the important. More kind of like this thing when you do the coding and, 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 and putting this together that you have some different options. And, and I, I mentioned this as like a couple of tricks here, merely because it's a really, really good option, and it's many times forgotten by a lot of, especially schools who program a solution for, for different things, that this is having a lot of different benefits that if you put it to sleep like that. So let me end it with that way, Judy. Um, I kind of have one more question, if that's okay. Um, Judy, you're on, you're on mute. Yeah, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. If, is it okay if we take it afterwards? Uh, it's just that we've run over for everybody and I think we need to close out the session. Okay. Great. Um, thank you everybody for, for attending. So what I've done is in the chat channel, I have made a, a note of the, the different uh, topics that we are going to be covering next week. So um, what we've got is we're going to be having a look at, um, at, at, at at pointing, we're going to have a look at um, propulsion, just uh, you know, to to an extent, uh, keeping it within a one U cube set and keeping it within uh, Leo orbits, uh, Leo Leo altitudes, and um, and also what we're going to be doing is looking at thermal management. Uh, how do we how do we get rid of our heat? Uh, that is accumulating on our cube set. So um, uh, what I'm going to do is over the next few days, uh, send out a number of different invitations with, with the different topics. And also we are, we are going to have more guest speakers in to our sessions. So with that, I'd like to say thank you everybody for joining us this, uh, today. 
it's this evening for us in South Africa, but today for you. And um, we look forward to seeing you once again on Tuesday. And please have a fabulous weekend. Cheers. <laughs>